The following program is a UW-TV classic. How much is enough putting money in its place ahead on Upon Reflection? University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Ross Reynolds. Consuming more but enjoying it less? Stick around. Joining us today is the woman the New York Times called the prophet of consumption downsizers. She is Vicki Robin, co-author of the best-selling Your Money or Your Life, Transforming Your Relationship with Money and Achieving Financial Independence. Vicki Robin's book and her work with the volunteer nonprofit New Roadmap Foundation has changed the way that many Americans view their money, their work, and their lives. Thanks very much for being with us, Vicki. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. What are we talking about when we're talking about simple living or frugality? How would you define it? Well, it's interesting that there is no really wonderful term in English for what we're trying to talk about, which is really the making the best use of every resource that you have, be it time, be it money, be it love, be it talents, whatever it is that you have, making the best use of it, and not just like an efficiency expert, but also with that wonderful sensuous joy of you know really maximizing every moment of life. Uh, so uh, the term simple living or voluntary simplicity seems to be the one that's caught on in the press. And that has to do more with an aesthetic, with a sense that, that life has become unmanageable and I want to simplify it. I don't want so many appointments, so much clothes, so much this, so much that, that somehow or another I'm drowning in my obligations and expectations and, and previous commitments. and. Um, so that's the idea of simplifying my life, and I do it voluntarily, not because I'm being forced to do it, but be I do it voluntarily. Frugality is more the technology. Frugality is, is how do you go about simplifying your life. It, it takes it from the realm of a philosophy and grounds it in practical, everyday reality. Americans equate money with, with freedom and with power. Mm -hmm. You sort of take that equation and, and turn it upside down and say it's quite the opposite. Why? Well, t for me, freedom and power comes from within me and uh, comes from being completely in control at a material level of my world and free at a, at a psychic level, <laughs> or psy a level of my psyche, uh, to, to roam. And let me, let me uh, clarify that a little bit. What I mean is that... Um, Financially, I have defined how much is enough for me. And I have pared down my accumulation of stuff to that which I can take care of, that which really serves me. And I don't have any excess. I don't have stuff I don't use and I don't want and I bought it on sale and I, it's, a, it's crowding my closet. I don't have all that stuff. I don't have any debt. Uh, so I don't have financial obligations like that. And I have been able to accumulate enough money through my working life to have savings and, and I can live on the interest from my savings and all of my time is free. So there could be somebody who lives on two times, three times, ten times the amount that I live on and yet they're not free because they're, fu they're full of worry, they don't understand their personal finances, they, actu they actually don't know what's going on, their accountant tells them, and they have to work uh, not a 40-hour week but an 80-hour week just to maintain the possessions that they have no time to enjoy. So. I think I'm a lot freer than people who may have much more money than I do. And uh, as far as power goes, I don't have to wait for somebody else to pay me to follow my conscience. In other words, you might have a sense like really what I'd love to do with my life, my sense of my calling in life is uh, to be a an interviewer. <laughs> no, I won't use that example. Um, but you might have a sense of calling in your life that you cannot pursue because you, of what you have to do for money. Mm -hmm. Now, I can pursue my calling 24 hours a day if I choose to because I don't have to wait for somebody else to tell me what to do. 
Now, you and people you work with who are working on the spaces generally probably make a lot less money or have many fewer possessions than other people do. You, like I, drive 14-year-old cars, and, and we don't have giant homes, and people have chosen to do this life because they feel as though that gives them power and that gives them freedom. Is that equation the same from person to person? Are there some people who aren't happy unless they have more material possessions? Is the equation different for them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and that's really one of the reasons why we wrote Your Money or Your Life is to provide people with a set of tools that they could apply, a set of lenses that they could apply to the flow of money in their lives and assess which, uh, which purchases, which possessions, which um, uh, uh, expenses actually add to their quality of life and which are just waste. And as people use these tools, they discover that on average about 20 to 25 percent of their expenses fall away just by paying attention and their quality of life goes up because they feel now they feel in control, they feel smart um, and they're maybe a little sheepish about how they used to live their lives but well you know I've turned over a new leaf. So, so each person defines how much is enough for them but enough I would say in, in every case I've heard of where people have used these tools has turned out to be less than people thought they needed. Hmm. How do you know how much is enough until you've had too much? In other words, how, do you, how can you make a determination that I don't really need these things until you have them in the first place? Well, it, it's a different question I think you're asking for um, middle class Americans, mm -hmm. uh, people, poor Americans, and then people in the uh, less developed countries. And uh, so uh, for a middle class American, and for a middle class American I would say is anybody, you, you know, the median income here in this country is someplace between thirty and thirty-five thousand dollars a year for a household of three, and so I would say that's that's like the center of the middle class. So if if you're anywhere from eighteen thousand to maybe fifty-five thousand, that's middle class. And I think there's a distorted vision of what is middle class in this country. First of all, I just want to say that mm -hmm. that people uh, are are always claiming middle class and oh um, yeah I earn $150,000 a year but really I'm in the middle class you know it's like well, I just can hardly make ends meet you know. It's a notoriously stretchable concept. Exactly class. so what I'm saying is what I'm talking about in middle class is these people who truly are in in the middle and I think that the people like that once they start to assess what's going on in their lives they might find that that indeed they are actually already over the top. Mm -hmm. We have a thing call, that we call the fulfillment curve, and it's just imagine an ellipse. You have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis, and you have whoosh, an ellipse. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of spending that's spending for your survival, just basics. Then there's a certain amount of additional spending that is for comforts, a beyond basics, but the, you know, it's like you're not sleeping on the floor anymore, you're no longer in college, you've got a bed and you've got a sofa, and et cetera. And that spending also brings fulfillment. And then you go on to another level of spending, which you could call luxuries. You now have paintings on the wall. Your life is gracious. It's beautiful. These are all things that add to the quality of your life. Maybe they cost the painting costs a lot more money than the, than the bottle that you got when you were a baby. Both bring satisfaction. And in the process of this whole process of acquisition of stuff in order to fulfill your needs, you you program into your mind, if I ever have a sense of emptiness inside, all I have to do is consume. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so we get habituated in this culture and we are supported by advertising, we are supported by overproduction which pushes products on us, uh, then to continue to consume beyond that point of sufficiency into a point where you have bought things that are no longer bringing you fulfillment but you have not consciously registered that because you think that more stuff equals more fulfillment. So for most Americans, if they would pay attention, they might find that there are types of consumption, there are things that they've bought that are really burdening their lives and not adding to their fulfillment. So I am eliminating the poor people and I'm in our country and mm -hmm. I'm eliminating the poor in the rest of the world from this discussion. There are things to talk about at those ends too, but n not here. The issues are different for those groups of people in, in other in developing nations, oh, for yeah. example, or there for are the people, very rich. There are, there are people who do not have enough. They do not have enough. They cannot make ends meet. 
and they can spend 24 hours a day just making ends meet. They are totally in survival mode, no comforts, forget about luxuries. And so you have to deal with those issues on another level, maybe on a social level. And there's, there's ways in which people can be educated at the bottom end to use the few dollars that they have more wisely. But I want to acknowledge that there are people who are having, who are having trouble at making ends meet and who, don't, who do not have enough. Give me some examples of the way that you have gotten people to rethink their consumption and to rethink how much money they absolutely need to live and some ways in which they've been able to use that reevaluation to change their lives. Oh, well, one of the cores of Your Money, Your Life is this analysis that we do about uh, what money is really. And um, when you think about it, we are, we are told many things in the course of our lives about what is money. Money, money is power. Uh, money is success. You, the, the bigger your paycheck, obviously you're a more important person. Whether or not you have any more skill to offer the world than the next guy down the line. If you're earning 100000 and he earns 75000 you're better. So it's, money's the way we keep score. Uh, money is uh, prestige. Money is uh, success with the opposite sex. It's like if you have the right clothes, the right car, the right look, the right this, the right that, you will be viewed as a more valuable person and you'll be able to attract a better mate. So money is, is, is tied up with all these needs for uh, approval and, um, and uh, getting ahead in life. But when you take a look at it, if you, have, if you were a Martian anthropologist, just come to Earth, and, uh, and so you kind of like come down and you're reporting back about what this thing, they have this thing called money, and I can't quite figure it out, but all I can see is that most of them seem to get into these, you know, these hard little things and go back and forth to someplace called the office. And, or the work site, and uh, eventually, after a week or a month, they get something called a paycheck. So mon money is something that I they trade the hours of their life for. People put, make money valuable by that trade. And our lives are very real to us. You know, all these fantasies about money meets success, that's not real, but our lives are real. We only have like 72, 75 years here. So once you understand that money equals the hours of my life, and that you, know, you think you're earning $20 an hour, which is maybe just above the median income, but if you take out taxes and daycare and car fare and job costuming, and if you add in the extra hours for your commute and you're this, you know, you're this and you're that, and you'll find out that that $20 an hour is actually only $10 an hour. And once you do that calculation and you find yourself saying, ah, you know, it's, it was a tough week. I'm going to go treat myself to a dinner out, 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. And you look at that and you say, that's six hours of my life. And you say, no way. That's six hours on the job in order to eat a dinner that's going to be gone from my body within 12 hours. Or you might say, wow, only six hours? Hmm. All right, and I'm going to really enjoy this steak. But at least you think about it. You at least think about it, and that's, it's a thinking tool. Mm -hmm. And as people use that thinking tool, what happens is they increase their consumption in places that bring them fulfillment and that places that are in alignment with their values. You know, they may tell Tommy, look, you know, we're going to have to buy you a used soccer uniform because I can't afford a new one. But when you think about that the most important thing in your life is, is your kids, you know, you might invest in the new soccer uniform. It's not about less of everything. It's about spending money in accordance with your values and making your values conscious at the point of purchase. You know, I'm curious, Your Money or Your Life was a giant bestseller, and there are study groups that have been set up around these yeah. ideas. There yeah, are a yeah. number of books that have come out. There have been radio programs. You've made appearances on major television shows. Do you have any idea how widespread this movement has become? Mm. It's hard to say. Yeah. It's really hard to say. Uh, I do know that uh, for two years now, Your Money, Your Life has been uh, among the top ten best-selling business books in North America. Now, I, uh, to me, that's significant. It's, and it's not significant uh, to stroke my ego. It's just significant that people really want this information. And I, I think they want it um, because uh, they're in debt. <laughs> mm -hmm. They need to save money. Um, our jobs are being threatened. Uh, the globalization of the marketplace has left everybody on kind of like a, a slippy, slidey uh, ground. We're not quite sure. We have to take uh, matters into our own hands. 
So there's there's that fear or you know fear of finances mm -hmm. sort of thing. There's environmental concerns um, that uh, no matter what you hear about uh, the global environment uh, this year with El Nino, every time you hear about the storm, you realize that driving my car is part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it all comes back again and again, whether it's debt, whether it's saving money, whether it's wanting to be with our kids more, whether it's a, uh, in the environment, uh, whether it's getting to be 50 years old and wondering what, what life is about and what's the meaning. It all comes back to how can I manage my money, the stuff that comes into and goes out of my life in such a way that I can have the life I want. Let's look a little at that spiritual component because I find that very interesting. Uh -huh. the, the saying from the Bible is, is something like a, a, a camel through the eye of a needle is more likely than a rich man getting into heaven. And the whole implication of that is that it's really better to be poor than it is to be rich. Is there a, a side of that to your beliefs? Uh, every single religion teaches moderation. Uh, there is no religion that I know of on this earth that really says be a greed head. You know, and that says greed is good, uh, except for the religion of economics, which is uh, some people treat as a religion. Um, all religions uh, uh, say moderation in all things. Uh, and there is a movement now in the Christian churches uh, towards stewardship, uh, this recognition that, uh, the, you know, the, this cup, well, this cup is yours, but let's say this were my cup, you know, this cup I isn't mine. This comes out of the earth. This is God's cup. In, in some essential way, this is God's cup. And, and it's mine to use for a certain period of time and to use well and wisely. Um, but if I don't pay attention to my consumption, if I, if I buy things I don't need, if I throw th a lot of things away because I've been uh, imprudent in my buying, um, if I hoard money, if I'm greedy, uh, this is all an insult to my relationship with God. It means that I'm a Sunday Christian. And, uh, you know, the other six days of the week, um, I'm an American consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, so people in, within uh, the Christian church, within all, um, you know, Catholics and, and many, many denominations are looking at this question of how can we, how can we st steward God's uh, creation better and understanding, understand with tremendous gratitude um, what we have here uh, in this country. It's like the opposite of greed for me um, is gratitude. It, it's like the more grateful you are for what you have, the less you're going to consume. <laughs> now, some people might be watching you and they might say, well, I can understand how you would say that simplifying in your personal life could give you greater satisfaction and maybe lead you away from work that you're just doing to make money. And I could see how it may even be more spiritual to move in that direction, to practice moderation. But there's a third part of our lives, and that's the component of, of our lives in society. We are, we are here in society and we are social beings with others around us. And it's very hard to deny that money in society does not provide power and freedom. I mean, witness the way that political campaigns are run in this country with more money equating to more television time, equating to being elected to high office. How does that fit into the equation when you look at the way that money does provide power and freedom in the, in the ability to influence others and actually create the society that we live in? Well, that's, that's one level that's going on. That's one level of the political world that, that is going on. And I mean, we're all observing this kind of, to me, this is ridiculous kind of dance of elephants, you know, really. <laughs> um, but if you take the politics closer to home, uh, and you take a look at what is it, what is, what is it here in Seattle? Well, it's um, participating in my neighborhoods, uh, my neighborhood. It's knowing, it's knowing my neighbors. It's um, uh, you know, applying for a small grant to do an improvement on my street or to get a kid something going. It, politics really is our relationship with one another outside of our household. Uh, and the more connectivity you have, the more you participate in your community, the more you go to the public hearings, the more you, uh, you actually treat the candidate, your, your um, elected officials as your representatives, not that they're telling you what to do, but that you're telling them what to do. The more you can participate at that level, or that um, you vote with your dollars, that you uh, shop at one store because you like the policies in the store, and you don't shop at another because you don't like the policies, and not only that, you tell them. Mm -hmm 
or you vote with the media. I, it, it's stunning to me that people do not realize that just doing a call to a television pro, uh, station and saying, hey, that was a great show you had on, 10 of those calls can keep a producer who's doing uh, forward-thinking programming on the air mm -hmm. uh, because that's a, a huge multiplier. We have so much power through our participation that we do not exercise. I, I mean, it's interesting that um, uh, television viewing has gone up 40% in the last 20 years. And, and now, so when, and on average, I think people watch about four hours a day. We could devote a portion of that time, just a portion of that time, to participation and exercise that kind of power. And I'm not, I'm not being dumb about, you know, pacts and mm -hmm. all that. I mean, I'm not being dumb about that. I know all that stuff happens. But just because that happens doesn't mean we need to kind of lie down and get rolled over by this big truck. Well, there's one way in which you agree with many major economists in, in <laughs> what you sketch out, and that has to do with saving, savings. Many people think that Americans don't save enough, don't put enough money away. In the last 10 years or so, actually, some people in the baby boom generation have turned around and begun to say, well, I can't be spending my paycheck every month. I need to put it away. And often, they've been putting it away in the stock market in the form of mutual funds. But you don't see that as saving. You see that as speculating. Could you explain the difference? Well, uh, it kind of, this is economics 101. Mm -hmm. this is, uh, um, stocks go up, stocks go down. Mm -hmm. um, mutual funds are... Um, funds that have stocks in them, most of them, unless it's a bond fund. Um, and so it means that um, you're buying somebody else's best guess of which bundle of stocks is going to go up or go down. So you might buy into a fund that makes a poor guess. So you put in your $10,000 life savings, you know, you, you've, you've sold off the second car, you realize you need to save money, you put it into XYZ mutual fund. And uh, then the Asian, Asian markets go, crash and somebody makes a poor decision in, in London and um, the, the wheat crop in, in um, Russia fails and your $10,000 is down to $4,992. Well, so that, that can happen. Mm -hmm. So stocks go up, stocks go down. Mm -hmm. so, so saving money to me is, is living within your means and actually living below your means. Saving money is, 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 is very, it's kind of very elemental. It's like w anybody um, watching this show who's like my age or older can remember, you know, you were taken down to the savings bank and you opened a savings account and, you know, you saved money from your allowance and you put it in the savings account or you put it in the piggy bank. I mean, it's that elemental. It's, it's living on less money than your income and taking that which you have saved and putting it aside. And you can use that for future consumption. Now see, you buy in debt, and what have you done? So you buy something for $2,000, 18.5% interest, uh, you pay the minimum amount, uh, it's gonna 3%, 3 it'll take you 14 years to pay that off and you'll pay $4,000 for that item. Mm -hmm. But you save the money for it, you're always earning interest on that money, and then you have the item maybe a little bit later. Along with your work in public speaking and also the book, Your Money or Your Life, and the sequel to it, you also are the co-founder of the new Roadmap Foundation, and you try to encourage various groups to work on these ideas. What are some success stories you can point to where you've been able to put out some seed money and seen these ideas go further? Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, all of the money that comes in from all of our educational work goes through the foundation, um, and nobody at the foundation takes any money for what we do. We're doing this because we choose to do it because it's, it's where our power is. Uh, and um, one of the organizations I love that we have funded since very early is uh, the Northwest Earth Institute. And it, uh, it started in Portland. There was a couple who, uh, when the man it was a prominent lawyer, he turned 50, um, both of them were strong environmentalists and they realized that they wanted to uh, give back to the world. They didn't need any more money, they had enough. Uh, so they decided that they could, he could keep on working as a lawyer and donate money to environmental organizations or form their own. And they have used his entree into uh, Portland businesses to start study groups on the issues of deep ecology. Their question is, how can we live for the earth? How can we change our mindset so that we're living for the earth instead of using up the earth for us? He started uh, study groups in 250 organizations uh, on deep ecology. And then people were so 
uh, enthralled with those eight-week study groups that they went on to study groups in voluntary simplicity. Now they have study uh, curricula on bioregionalism and on sustainability, and uh, his programs are going nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, and this is all, and it's, it, you know, him, he and his wife are just volunteering to do this because they believe in it. There's another group um, in uh, Boston I really like. Um, uh, the Sustainable Living Institute, and it's really the brainchild of one woman who said there's so much going on in the Boston area on the subject of sustainability. How can we live our lives in such a way that the, uh, you know, that future generations sure. can have enough? And and so she has all sorts of, she has a newsletter, and she's supporting many many projects through this institute. You've told me that you see a, a backlash in place <laughs> in this country operating uh, uh, against some of the ideals that you've talked about in this program. What are, what are some of the examples of that? Where's that coming from? Well, actually, I mentioned that to you on the phone uh, because I had seen an article, I think, in the paper where somebody was extolling the virtues of, I don't know whether, oh, it was, it was a stretch. It wasn't a stretch limo. It was a stretch. Um, uh, uh, I can't even know that. I don't even know the name. What is it? The utility vehicles. Sports, sports utility vehicle. Yes, yeah, sport utility. I see. It was a stretch sport utility vehicle, and these are the co the coolest thing in mm -hmm. New York City. Um, uh, and I mean, where you really need an off road vehicle. Where you <laughs> really need a sport utility vehicle, a stretch sport utility vehicle. Um, so, uh, and this is something I saw early in the '80s, and it was like really distressing after the '70s. Now, what has happened? You know, are we going backwards? My, by my um, way of seeing it, though, there is something happening globally, which is the environmental limits uh, that we're coming up against that is not going to allow us to have a backlash like we had in the 80s. That is, we're going to come to moderation because we we're going to be stopped to in our tracks. Right. We'll be forced to come to moderation because yeah. of that. Yeah. And better to, better to embrace it before you're forced than to have to be um, forced to do it. Do you think that'll happen? You sound like an optimist. Oh, the people, oh, yes, and you asked earlier about uh, the number of people who are engaged mm -hmm. in this movement. I mean, there are estimates of something like 15% of the baby boomers are coming on board. There's another estimate that 44% of Americans uh, in some way or another are practicing values that are at least in, in the environment of uh, voluntary simplicity. There are, uh, there are people, as I said, because there are so many um, streams fe feeding this river of thrift that's running through our culture, because it, it is an aesthetic, because it's an environmental issue, because it's a financial issue, because it's a human family issue, mm -hmm. because of that, it's getting stronger. The book is called Your Money or Your Life. <laughs> the group is called the New Roadmap Foundation. Vicki Robin, thank you very much for being with us on Upon Reflection. I appreciate it. Oh, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.